like to talk about sort of a boxcar filter discussion uh, and how we solve it, how we think about it, how we work through this, this conversation. And I want to do this from a discrete time perspective, although there's going to be some continuous pieces that come in here because there's some very nice um, connections. And so when we talk about a boxcar filter, what we're going to be talking about is having some input y of n is basically just going to be a bunch of samples. This is what we typically are used to doing for like trying to average things. Let me average m things together. And so then I'm going to go from k equals 0 to m, e m minus 1, and I'm going to average m of them together. You might hear this also talked about as a moving average filter, which is basically I'm taking an average and I'm moving it along. So we see this used in many, many places. So if I start off with this structure, then I actually get from my impulse response, just the impulses of all of those in discrete space. Another way to look at this in discrete space is also that I can use the unit step function and use the subtraction of two step functions, which is kind of cool because it'll step up and then after m and at m it steps down. Same property, and it's kind of useful to think about it in those terms that, the, that we got something similar there. Well, the nice thing is if I look at the, the z transform, it's straightforward. It's basically just a sum of z, z's with their delays on it. Reconsider response is just the sum of the exponentials. And so as a result, this was really useful, and you're like, okay, that's great. But there's one step further that actually makes it a little bit more interesting. And you might remember sort of an interesting identity that says, hey, if I have a sum of terms to a given power, and if I look at that, I can actually write the expression, assuming the series converges, I can write an expression of 1 minus a to the m terms over 1 minus a, and you think, hmm, this is quite useful here. Because it both gives me an h of z, an h of j, and an h of a, a frequency, an h of omega, that are quite reasonable to work with. Well, the h of z is quite interesting, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. The h of omega, I can start from these two exponentials with a little bit of math in here pulling out part of the, part of the terms. What I end up finding is, is I get an e to the j omega m minus 1 over 2. And then I get a sine, uh, I get a sine over sine, sort of a sinh function. And this is really cool because um, this gives me sort of an interesting function. One of the things I know about this function is that at uh, omega, at the sample to omega equal to zero, h is one at this point. And so that works out really well. And then I also get something to help me with the phase discussion. And what's interesting then as I look at this is I can see all sorts of different formulations going from minus pi to pi. Uh, I certainly get some interesting peak lobes here and peak lobes here, but I also get zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven zeros. Um, plus pi and minus pi are the same, right, even though you can see them. And notice that I actually can actually look at this h of z and go, wait a minute, I can get, you know, m roots for the top here, which is then, in this case, I'm going to pick 8, because I'm with 8 in this case. And that actually gives me a nice eight of them around the circle. Now, technically, the one that's at uh, z equals one is not a zero because I've got, actually got something in the denominator that I divided by. So that's not quite there, which is why in the end I got seven zeros. Um, and that's where this expression goes to zero. You also know that it's very much passing through things that are not changing quickly. So sample frequency of zero looks quite flat. And then it goes down from there. And, but we definitely get zeros and then it sort of pops up before I get to um, basically to pi or reflected a minus pi. And so this is a really valuable function and an interesting way to start thinking about the frequency responses and what I can use with it. There's also some interesting related functions to this, right? Because when you realize I've got u to the n minus u to the n mi minus m, just like we were showing before, I get a really, you know, I get very, very interesting expressions, which is basically just summarizing this. Well, here's an interesting thought. What, what if m goes to infinity? Well, now that's just the response for u, u to the n, which is a nice way to get this. And what you find is for h of z is 1 over 1 minus z minus 1. The frequency response is 1 minus 1 minus e to the j, j omega hat, which is for small omega really 1 over j omega hat, which is interesting because it kind of is something related to an integral. And for those who are familiar with Laplace transforms, or Fourier transforms, you realize, okay, there I get a 1 over s or 1 over j omega. So I'm getting exactly the same behavior in terms of sort of an integral. In fact, this gets used in a number of different physical properties where if you can make a frequency response be fairly low frequency, 
um, that, you know, or you say at a lower frequency or like oversample, I can make things look sort of ideal from a more continuous perspective. Um, but it's very interesting that effectively this looks like an integral and it's an integral of the delta function and we can kind of build from there. And it kind of gives you a sense of weight. I could come up with an integration kind of function as well out of this in a more general case um, from all sorts of fun convolution concepts. Also, one other one. Imagine I have a to the n, right? And now I want to use, I actually have a real sequence. Well, I actually kind of know from the same structure that I'm now going to get an h of z that looks like 1 over 1 minus a to the minus z minus 1. And you're thinking, oh, that's interesting. And then I also can get a frequency response related to that. And for those of you who are familiar with like Laplace, you know that that looks like a 1 over s plus a. And you're like, hmm, OK, this is starting to feel there's some familiarity here in the structures. And this turn out to be very useful transforms back and forth as we go forward and backwards to these transform spaces. But what's interesting about this kind of a structure is that this is very, very similar to asking a question of what would be the solution to, say, a very simple first order uh, difference equation. And so as a result, now you can start asking some very interesting questions of that's what it looks like a difference equation. You can imagine that's also related to the differential equation if a is near 1. And it starts to feel like, ah, OK, now we're getting a whole range of dynamics here that sort of just come out from thinking, hmm, what is the solution of a boxcar filter? And this really helps us kind of see that there's a whole bunch of concepts that are all really nicely connected through the system.